Morning, good morning. Welcome to Venture Church. Oh, man, that, what a beautiful prayer just to lead us right into this moment. My name is Aaron. I'm really excited to be here with you all this morning via live stream on what is our last Sunday service of this year before we kick off to the year 2021. And I think we could all celebrate just a little bit more this year when we change that zero to a one because, yeah, this, this year has been crazy. I don't even have to tell you about that. That's good news there. But I love this season. It's a good time. that There's Christmas cookies, the smell of hot apple cider, Christmas trees. Uh, even the new year brings a sense of new opportunity, new beginnings, fresh start, clean slate. And it's just, just good news all around. And in this series that we're in right now, it's called Christmas at the Movies, and each week we're taking a look at a particular Christmas movie to use it as a launching pad to take us into God's Word. And uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at a particular character that does not think that Christmas is good news. In fact, he would probably say it's the worst news, that it's noise, 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 noise. He's kind of a mean one. Um, he's as cuddly as a cactus, uh, charming as an eel. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would not touch him with a 39 and a half foot pole. I'm just saying, I just wouldn't. You know the movie I'm talking about. You know the movie that we're going to be going over. It is Die Hard. Yep. That's the, I'm just kidding. It's not Die Hard. Um, it is the Grinch. It's how the Grinch stole Christmas. It's one of my favorites. Uh, particularly, we're going to be going over the, uh, the one from 1966, the original, the true How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Um, nothing against Jim Carrey. I think he's awesome. I actually love that version. But just for the sake of this morning, we're doing that one. Uh, quick little fun fact. Uh, as I was watching it this past week, I was kind of shocked. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's only 26 minutes long. It's a little TV special. For some reason, like as a kid growing up, I thought it was like an hour or more, but it's just a little short movie. So if you want to just like watch it and then come back here, I'll be at my closer. You can get the practical stuff and just leave. That's fine as well. But um, another little fun fact is um, that movie, the narrator and the Grinch are actually the same person. Not like in the movie, but like uh, the actual voiceover actor is the same guy. They just adjusted the EQ on the Grinch's voice uh, to make it a little raspy and and make it the same, but something I just thought was quirky and fun. But um, as we look into the Grinch and the clip we're about to watch, I love it because it's the introduction to the movie and it sets up this question that uh, the narrator is kind of puzzling is, why does the Grinch hate Christmas? Why is he so uh, against all of that and the who's down in Whoville? So let's check this clip out. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Oh, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the who. Staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm, lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every who down in Whoville beneath was busy now, hanging a holly who wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers, nervously drumming. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. So yeah, the Grinch just hates Christmas. This is not good news for him. And maybe your perspective about Christmas and New Year's is not hate, but maybe this season is not just good news. It's it's kind of bad news sometimes because maybe you were hoping a particular someone was going to be here this season. Maybe you were hoping that you'd have a job lined up and the new year just puts more stress on finding that right job to support the family. And it's just maybe a stressful time because you can't see the family that you hope to see or be around the people you hope to be around. But 
If that's the case for you, I, I'm sorry. And I hope this morning we can bring good news because here's the thing. The Christmas story, the reason Christmas exists is for this. See, when they announced the birth of Jesus, when it was titled, the headline they used was this, good news. It says in Luke chapter two, the angel says, behold, I bring you good news that will cause great joy. That means when you hear this, something will light up. You're gonna see something in a new way. This is great joy. It's gonna cause you great joy. And a couple of weeks, Joe actually talked about joy. He talked about uh, the word, the, the foundation of it, what it is, what it isn't. And if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to go back. It's an excellent message. It's got some really practical things of how to uh, understand and, and become a joyful person. So check that out. But this good news will cause great joy. Here's the thing, here's the kicker that was so surprising, especially for the people at this time, for all people, for all generations, not just a group of people get this goodness, but everyone. And the thing is, is it was so good, the news was so good, they just wanted to call the whole thing the good news. The good news means the gospel. And that's why our four first, first books of the New Testament are called the gospels, because it's just about Jesus's life, because he is good news. So again, I want to ask this question. If the message of Jesus is that good, if the message of Jesus will cause great joy for all people, then why aren't more people leaning in? Why aren't more people wanting it to be true? And maybe they're not like the Grinch and, and hating it, but just ambivalent. This uh, message of Jesus, I give it or take it. Christianity is not for me. Why don't more people want to seek the church and check it out? Because the thing is, is the original version of the news was so good, it was compelling. And it was so compelling that it was worth telling. And it was so worth telling that you didn't have to pay anybody to, to tell it. In fact, in the beginning of Luke chapter one, he says, many people endeavored to tell and document the story of Jesus. Many people gave their lives to proclaim this message, not because they were paid to do so or their arm was pulled, but because they knew it needed to be preserved. They knew what they had in their hands, what they heard. They knew that it was good and it was for every generation and they had to share it. So my question I want to wrestle with this morning as we continue on, as we move from the Grinch, what happened? Particularly, what happened to the good news? Why isn't everybody leaning in? When they hear the good news, why doesn't everybody hope it to be true? And I'm not pointing my finger at anybody this morning. If I am, I'm, I'm pointing the finger at me. Maybe what happened is we happened. Maybe what happened is it's a little bit our fault because the church has Americanized the good news. I don't know how we could have helped it. I mean, we've certainly politicized the good news. And I don't know if this is really a word, but we've prosperitized the good news. Maybe a little bit of an internalized the good news. What I mean by that is sometimes we have reduced it to something that we just believe and not about what you do. Oftentimes people see Christianity as kind of an insurance policy. It's like, I've signed up, I've paid my premiums, I've got my coverage, and I'm covered for what happens to the event after this life. But the thing is, is that when you read the gospel, when you read the story of Jesus, it's not primarily about what happens after this life. Now it's in there, it's in there. But it's not primarily about what you believe Again, it's in there. It's concrete, but it's primarily about what you do, how you live your life, how we treat one another. And when it gets reduced into what's in it for me, in spite of how it affects you, that's not the original news that Jesus proclaimed. That's not the good news that Jesus came to start, and that's not the kingdom that God came to begin. And the moment that we do that, and the moment that I do that and preach that way, it's no longer good news of great joy for all people. So the question this morning kind of shifts from what happened to this. What about me? Am I good news? And the question is for you, if you're a Jesus follower, that is, are you good news of great joy for all people or just the people like you that you like? Because <laughs> I have a feeling 
If we had gotten this right, if we embody the good news, our communities, our nation, maybe even the world would be in a gooder, better place. I know that's not a word. (laughs) Do you remember what Jesus said would characterize his followers? Maybe this is the first time, but but one thing he said is, it's not correct belief. He says, no, by this, everyone will know you're my disciples by the way that you treat, by the way that you love one another. And the way that you treat and the way that you love one another, that's good news. And every generation of Jesus followers, every generation of Christians are responsible for ensuring that our news is the original news of Jesus. Another way Jesus said this is he said, you, in Matthew 5, 14, when he says you, he means you, <laughs> he means you and you and you and me. He says, you are the light. Like the lights turned on. Like I once was in darkness, but now I'm in light. I see my enemies different. I see my friends different. I see the world different. I see my relationships different. He says, you are the light of the world. And the people he's talking to in this moment on the Sermon on the Mount, they're like, what? I mean, our city's not even but a 15 mile radius, Jesus. Like, we're not the light of the world. Like, he's like, no, 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 you don't get it. This is bigger than you. This is not about just Judea. This is not just about Samaria. This is about bigger, even bigger than the nation. This is about the world. And he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that, that they may see something that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He says, look, when they see your good deeds, I want them to see a connection between your good deeds and your good Father. We have a responsibility to make sure that our news is the original news of Jesus in this model here. There was this guy named Paul. You've probably heard of him. Uh, We meet him in the book of Acts and the New Testament, but he did not really see the good news as good news at first. In fact, he was kind of against it. He was a persecutor of the church, what they called themselves the way back in that time. And he wanted to put them out of the way. See, what he didn't realize is that Jesus was beginning a new order, a new way of things, a new kingdom. And he was a Pharisee and what he held on to was in the law of the prophets. And what he didn't know is that there's this transition happening from the old way to Jesus restoring a new kingdom. And so what happens is he encounters the brick wall that is the grace and love and mercy of Jesus Christ. He lays down all of his old ways of persecuting the church and he begins with a new message. He keeps the same passion, the same vigor, and he spreads the gospel. He would say, I didn't know the original news. I didn't know that it was for everybody. And so he gives his life to clarify for everyone how good this news really is. And so this morning, we're going to read a particular passage from that guy. He wrote it uh, to a church in Philippi in Greece. And uh, uh, we're going to be in the second chapter, Philippians chapter two. And um, before we read this, um, if you grew up in church, you've heard this before. Um, If you've been attending Venture Church, I know you've read this before. But I want to encourage you as we read this, don't just let these verses slip by because you've read them before. I want us all to, when we read this, imagine what if this characterized every Christian father? What if this characterized every Christian mother? What if this characterized your mother? What if this characterized every Christian coach, every Christian teacher, every Christian college student, every Christian high school student? What if this characterized every Christian in the world? Philippians chapter two, Paul says, therefore, speaking to the church, uh, particularly, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, what Paul is saying here, look, if there's anything good that is happening in your life because of Jesus, if you've been united with him, encouragement, compassion, love from Christ, look, anything good's come your way because of the gospel, please do me a favor please do me a favor. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. He says, look, if you've been united with Christ, 
Make my joy complete so that when people look into your life, they'll see something different. They'll see something unique that's not like the world. It will be light into the communities and into your churches. When people look into your church, I want them to see unity. I want them to see love and how you treat each other. Allow the good of the gospel to overflow into all those different areas of your life and your relationships. This isn't simply about something you believe. It's about what we do, how we live. So Paul, continue on. What do you have in mind, Paul? What do you have in mind? He says, okay, are you ready? And we're like, yeah, we're ready. And he's like, I don't think you're ready. And we're like, no, we want to do this right. How, do, how can we live our lives that show that the gospel is good? He says, okay, here we go. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't you like to work for somebody like that? If you're hiring, wouldn't you like to hire somebody like that? Don't you wish your father was that way? Aren't you glad your father is that way? He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Why would we do that, Paul? <laughs> so I'm glad you asked, because it's the very center, the very pinnacle of the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave the verse that Bethel just shared a little while ago. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world, he valued you. Not because you're more valuable than God, but that he chose to add value to you. He valued you above himself. He treated you as if you had more value. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to act like that. And when people see that, they'll say that's good. And they'll see a connection between that good work and our good father. Imagine if that were true. Imagine if that's how we all lived. He continues on in a, in a different way of saying, he says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Why? Because that's what Christ did for us. Jesus came to the world for your best interest. Again, not because you should come first or I should come first, but that Jesus chose to put you first. And he says, if you're going to follow me, if you want to call yourself a Christian, that's what you have to do. And as Jesus followers, it's not just what we believe. We got that down. It's what we do. He continues on. He says, in your relationships. What relationships? All relationships. Your husband relationship, your wife relationships, your son, your daughter, your friend, the guy you like, the guy you don't like, the people you work with, the people you see at the counter, in your relationships with one another, get this, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. Why? Because it's good. When you have the same mind as Christ Jesus, you will add value to others. You will humble yourselves before others. You will place yourself under their burden instead of requiring them to place themselves under you. You will act like Christ Jesus, and that's unusual. You think of your workplace. What if the people you work with were humble to serve like that, to have the same mindset of Christ Jesus? It's unusual. It's not how the world works but it's the value system of the kingdom of God. It's the value system that was introduced when a baby was born into this world. Good news of great joy for all people. That is our Messiah. That is our King. Continues on. Get some water. It continues on. He says, who, speaking of Jesus, who, being in very nature God, I know we, we've said this passage many times. Again, if you've gone to venture, you've heard this before, but think of this, like when Paul's writing this, like Peter, Peter, tell me, how was Jesus like? He was like, he, he, he was like God. I, I can't explain it. It was, it was like when he spoke, it was like the words of God. James, James, tell me, tell me about your brother, Jesus. Well, growing up with him, he was kind of different. Um, he's a little bit weird, <laughs> but, but eventually he started talking about he was a rabbi and Messiah. And I was like, you're crazy, man. You're not a rabbi. You're crazy. And then he actually did what he said he was going to do and died on the cross and rose from the grave and gave my life for that, 
that mission and that cause. And so Paul's saying, who, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Wait, so you're telling me that God did not consider equality with that something to be used to his own advantage, like most people think of God? Yeah, he used his power and his influence for the sake of those with less power and less influence. He used his power and his influence as God for the sake of you and I with less power and less influence. There are communities in this country, there are nations around the world that this one idea that's at the center of our gospel would free so many people, would feed so many people, would redeem and and liberate so many people would improve the quality of life and the lifespan of so many people. If world leaders, if politicians would embrace this one idea, there would be so much good in the world, we couldn't even contain it. Is the message of Jesus good? Are you kidding? That God in heaven came down to the world as Emmanuel, God with us, for good news of great joy for all people, using his power and influence for the sake of those with less power and less influence? There is nothing better. That's the father you hope raised you. That's the father you hope to be. That's the father I hope to be someday. That's the mother you're thankful for. That's the mother that, man, if she only got this one idea right, our whole family tree would be different. That would be good news for the whole world. Continuing on, Paul says, rather, Jesus, he made himself nothing. How far did he take it? This is the part of the story that shook everybody. This is the part of the story where it starts to turn tables. Everyone perked up. Everybody leaned in. He says, by taking the very nature of a servant, Jesus being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. And here's the kicker. Here's the part where As Americans in our culture, we don't really wrestle with this word like they did back then. Even death on a cross. Do you know what the goal of crucifixion was? The goal of crucifixion was oblivion. It was like you had never been born. Your family would disown you. Your friends would say they didn't even know you. People wouldn't even know where you're buried. And this is the death that our Savior chose. He said, I came to serve, not to be served. And he says, I want you to emulate that. I want you to do that and follow me because it's good news for the whole world because I have came, come to seek and save the lost. This is our Savior. This is our King, Jesus leveraging his power and his influence for the sake of those with less power and less influence. Skipping down to verse 12, Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill, fulfill his good purpose. He says, continue to work it out. Don't, don't just stop here. Like I know Jesus has died for you. We believe in that. We have that salvation through him. But he says, look, don't just let that sit there. Be the good news for the people around you with fear and trembling, for it is God who wants to use you. It is God wanting to use you to spread the good news of great joy for all people. He's using us for that. And he continues to say, do everything without grumbling or arguing speaking to Christians and Christians, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Do you know what it means to be blameless? Being blameless doesn't mean you're perfect. What a blameless person does is when they mess up, they immediately own it. (laughs) They immediately apologize for it. They don't have anything to blame for because they said, hey, this is me, my bad. I dropped the ball. Before someone can blame them, they immediately go and they fess up to it. So, oh, I got to go in there and talk to her about that. No, 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 she's already blamed it or owned it. Ooh, okay. Uh, oh, I got to go in there and talk to him. No, he's already, he's already owned it. Okay, <laughs> we can move on. What if your workplace was like that? What if our families were like that? We just immediately owned it, immediately apologized and, and, and took care of it. 
Let's be blameless people. Let's immediately own it and apologize. Let's not let people catch us in our blame. So that he continues on all of what we're going through so that you could become blameless and pure children of God without fault and a warped, what's in it for me, crooked generation. Then, Paul continues, calling back to the same verbiage and wording from Jesus in Sermon on the Mount that we read, then you will shine. Then you will be the light. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Then you will be the light of the world as you hold firmly to the word of life. He says, Paul is saying to the church, look, don't just let this belief system, don't just let the good news just sit there. Work it out and take it into your families, into your relationships, into everything that you do. Because it's good for all people. So, let's put some handles on this. Let's be a little bit practical with this message. How does the good news behave? How does the good news behave? What positions us to not just believe, but to be good news of great joy for all people? So I've got three suggestions. I've got three challenges um, to guide us through this application. You'll find them familiar because they come right out of this passage in Philippians 2. So three suggestions for the Christmas season and the end of the year, because we know how this time can be. It can be stressful. It can be frustrating to, to deal with what we're going through. And maybe Christmas isn't exactly what you wanted because we can't really travel that much. And you're not able to see the family you're hoping to be. And maybe the, the new year and this time, you got some time off and you got some, some you days. You got some days just for you. You got some hours just for you. And somebody or something is going to come up and bump into one of your you days. So how can we be good news of great joy for all people? How can we be the light of the world in our relationships this Christmas season? Three suggestions. Here we go. Number one, we just talked about it. Own it immediately. Apologize immediately. We're not always good news, are we? I know I'm not. Oh man, when we mess up, let's just own it. Let's just apologize immediately for it. Then guess what? We're blameless. Now there's repercussions. There's things we got to deal with. There's, there's consequences for our action, but, but let's be blameless and pure from that. And if, for a moment, I'd like to just speak to the guys for a second, uh, mainly because I'm not a girl, so I don't know if uh, you do this, but just men, you know what we do when we mess up? I mean, our, our ego gets in the way sometimes and we just, we, we don't own it. We kind of walk around the house or wherever it happened. You start to justify it and justify it and justify it. And you have these little imaginary conversations in your head of what could have happened, what I should have said, and maybe we should do it this way. No, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm in the right here. And you, you do this and we drag it out and we keep going and, and we ruin their afternoon. We ruin their weekend. We ruin the week. Let's just not do that <laughs> for a couple weeks. Let's just own it. Because the thing is, you're going to come later and apologize. So let's just do it immediately. Then guess what? You're blameless. You're not perfect. We mess up. We still have repercussions from it, but let's just own it and move on. This one thing may be something that could restore a part of your marriage. This one thing may be something that could restore a relationship that there's a fault just been sitting there under the rug. This could be the one thing that could restore love and respect in your marriage as well. Let's own it immediately. Own it, own it, own it. Number two, be present consistently. How can we be the good news if we aren't aware of our surroundings, aware of the room, aware of the conversations, aware of the joy that's right in front of us? Not just to be plugged in to what's, what's around us, but the conversations as well. That, I don't know about you, um, but this pandemic has honestly revealed a lot of things in my life that I've seen that's just not good. Maybe some habits that, that I've had and um, something about our culture that maybe we can all agree on is this time that we're living in, there's never been a time that so many things are fighting for our attention. There are so many things that want your eyes. They want your focus Every social media post, every news article, when you're at the gas station pump, there's an ad. There's notifications popping up every time. And everything is just screaming, look at me. And there's times where we miss 
the good news around us. We miss those opportunities, especially at a season, at a time like this. I'm just going to be bold and say something. Your family does not want to compete with your phone. Your family does not want to compete with the TV or with the video game. They want your presence. Not your presence, but your presence being around them. So let's be present in this moment. Let's be present with our families. Let's be present consistently. When you come home, I, a little practice that, that I've been doing recently, and this is, I didn't really plan this, but just something I, I recommend. Um, people that have commutes, you come from work, I recommend this. First thing, when you get home, you have your phone or whatever, put it to the side, take a pause 45 seconds, 60 seconds. I know what you're about to go into, the kids, all the things, 60 seconds, and just decompress. Have a little moment with the Lord. Say, Lord, help me to be present for my family. Help me to just lay down what happened to work today. Help me to just be available for my wife. Help me to be available for my kids. Help me to just be present. We can talk about all the things we got to talk about later, but just for a couple hours, Lord, just let us enjoy dinner together and release those things. I just Maybe a little practice that might be helpful for you in this season to just have a moment of releasing. Just a suggestion. Let's be present consistently um, so we can be the good news and be available um, for other people at this time. Because we might miss some good things. We might miss some good joys if we're not. Third one and last one, last suggestion for the Christmas season. Eat last habitually. This one's a little fun because uh, one, it's, it's not like the world. Um, it, you could take it literally, but we'll take it a little bit farther. Uh, the root, again, comes from our scripture to serve, not to be served. Um, but the wording, eat last, actually comes from a book from Simon Sinek, uh, a guy, really, an author, speaker, really a great book. It's called Leaders Eat Last. It's a leadership book, of course, but the principle is, and the reason why he kind of titled that and wrote it, um, was because he was trying to figure out why certain businesses, why certain teams and, and organizations thrive, why they have unity and morale and through some tough times and why others fall. And so he's having this conversation with a Marine general who spent decades in the military. He says, what is, what's the secret sauce of, of the military to just have this, this unity in tough times? And he says, this. Officers eat last. It's like, what? <laughs> it says, officers eat last. It says, in the chow hall, officers are the back of the line. This is the same as true and in, in when we squat up and we're out on the battlefield. He says, my, my troop comes first. Their comfort comes first. My comfort comes last. Not only that, but survivability. He says, I, I'll lay by, down my life before they take theirs. And so in that same way, that's what Jesus did for us. In that same way, we are to be people who eat last. And so literally, if you want to take it that far, let's eat last. Let's eat last. People get their plates first. People get full first. People get fulfilled first. I get full last. I get fulfilled last. I get to choose last. I get what I want last. I get what I need last. You can even take it a step further to be even a more servant. Instead, not only do I get it last, but I will get it for you first. I'll get your plate first. I'll help you get fulfilled first. I'll help you choose first. I'll get what you want first. I'll get what you need first. Because that's good news. That's how Jesus lived. And he asked us to emulate that, to serve, not to be served to love and treat everyone in all relationships in this way. Why do we do this? Because Jesus did it for us. On the very day he was born, in the form of a baby, he lived the perfect life, he died the perfect death, and he put us all first. My favorite part of the Grinch, maybe your favorite part too, um, is a part after he's stolen Christmas. He's, uh, he's, he's taken all the trees, he's taken all the ornaments and the stockings and the presents, and he's even taken the hoop puddings and the roast beast. <laughs> he has taken it all, and he goes all the way to the top of the mountain, and it's packed up there, and he's got his dog there, and he's, he's staring down, and he's expecting to see something. 
He's expecting to see them just in a panic. <laughs> Christmas is gone. It's been stolen. And they're wallowing and they're sad. And he's expecting to see them in pain. But you know what he sees? He's a who's just gather around. And they sing the song. They always sing. You know the song. And they're joyful. And they're happy. Because you know what? That's not what Christmas is about. And the beautiful part of this moment, I don't know if you recognize this, but as I was just going over this talk, I realized no one had to go up to the mountain and like convince the Grinch of what he's done. No one had to go up and be like, you're in the wrong, Grinch. <laughs> Your message is wrong. You don't believe what I believe. You know what they did? They just continued on. They did what was good. They did what caused great joy because that is the message of the Christmas season. And what's beautiful is, well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. <laughs> when we embody the good news of Jesus, when we become the good news of Jesus Christ, when we personify and people see the light of Jesus in us, not only will we become resilient in tough times, not only will, when things don't go our way and things get stolen from us, will we become resilient and strong and have a foundation of joy, but the world will see that and they'll see a connection between those good deeds and our good Father. And maybe, just maybe, their hearts will grow to maybe three sizes someday. I'd love to pray for us this morning.